This isn't just a table. Look close enough, and you'll see that it's marked with moments of joy and laughter, sadness and celebration. In its grooves and lines, dents and stains, are the sounds of hundreds of dishes being set, chairs being pulled up and pushed back, and the laughter of stories, the chorus of birthdays, and the difficult conversations that stretch into the night. And this table are the scars and testaments of a life well lived. And that is why this is far more than a place to gather, break bread, and give thanks. It is a sacred place where an extra chair is easily added and there's always room for just one more. Where we welcome those we've just met as easily as those we cherish most. Because here, you are unconditionally accepted and loved, no matter what. This is what it means to sit at Christ's table. He calls us to share it with as many as possible and invite them to come alongside us as we pursue Him. So in this season of Thanksgiving, remember to embrace the ones you love. Make space for those who no one else will. Celebrate our differences. Be the arms and feet of Jesus. And give thanks for the one who unites us all at the table. Glad you guys are here this morning. Kids are off to kids worship. Uh, as they're leaving, if you have a Bible, God's Word, you version on your phone, go ahead and get that out. Luke chapter 5 is where we're going to be at this morning. Uh, if you do not have a copy of God's Word, we'd love to give you one. And so uh, you can head to the welcome desk now or after service, a uh, complimentary Bible that we'd love to put in your hands and you could bring every single week. And so Luke Chapter 5 is where we're going to be at this morning. As you're turning there, I want to celebrate uh, for just a couple of seconds. Uh, last week, we told you that 10% of our offering is going to go to Keene Storehouse. It's a food bank not funded by the government, but funded by the generosity of people. Um, it's not just meeting a physical need of putting food on the table for many families this Thanksgiving and Christmas, but also provides spiritual conversations. Not just a physical need, but lives are actually changing with this ministry, this local ministry. And because of your generosity, we're giving them this week just over $1,500. And so thank you guys for giving. Uh, I want you to know when you give, it matters. And thank you, thank you, thank you. For your generosity, not just meeting needs here, but Tyler and to the ends of the earth. And, and some people have asked me, you know, why not just mention something and just have people just give to it? Instead of having 10 to 20 people give to this need, there's weight in what we're doing with 10% of our offering. Number one, we're tithing back into our community what God has called you to tithe to the church. Secondly, we do it together. All of us have skin in the game when we celebrate it. It's not the 10 people that gave to it, it's all of us. And we don't have just a fancy slogan of together we, but in everything we do, let us do it together. And so thank you for your generosity in doing that. Uh, second is I want to share a story because it's stories that happen around this table that make life happen. We talked last week as we kicked off this series that a lot of things happen around the table, not just for a holiday like Thanksgiving coming up, but um, interviews, businesses, meeting someone for the first time, taking someone out on a date. There's a lot of things that capture our mind and attention when it comes to a meal or comes to a seat at the table. And personally, I want to share a story about this church called Southside. For several years, 
this church has prayed for young people to take a seat at this table, to gather around, to hear the good news of Jesus Christ, to be changed by the good news of Jesus Christ, and that we would see more young people find and follow this person named Jesus. As I'm talking, there's going to be a couple of pictures on the screen that you can just kind of see, and a picture is a thousand words. But this past August, we decided to start a young adult um, home group off campus at Kent and Jenny Faulkner's house. And over the course of several months, every single week, there's 20 to 25 young adults that gather there around a table, around a meal to do life together. Since uh, January this past year, we've had 68 new people from the ages of 19 to 35 years old. 68. Um, That's incredible. And it's all because of the willingness of people to pray, to say, you know what, we need to get more people around this table that don't look like us, that don't think like us, that everybody is welcomed at the feet of Jesus and the table of Jesus. Uh, And it's been incredible, story after story after story of what God's doing through these young adults and through our young marrieds. And I'm so thankful for uh, Rebecca and Josiah Baxter. I'm thankful for Russell uh, Atherton. I'm thankful for Grant and Elizabeth Loop. I'm thankful for so many people that play a vital role in names that I haven't even mentioned to help guide and direct our young adults and young marrieds. Check this out. One story I want to mention to you, because I want you just to to see the goodness of God and what God's doing. Uh, A guy by the name of of Gunnar Mason. Gunnar was invited by a church member named Josh Hoover, who put it on his heart to reach out to Gunnar, and through his obedience and heart just to reach other people, he's actually probably reached half of his workforce, work base. Uh, several co-workers go to church here now, but Gunner was far from God. Gunner decided to put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and you can see his baptism on the screen, but a baptism doesn't stop right there. A baptism is always supposed to lead to another baptism. And I can tell you this, we've baptized 22 people this year alone. 13 out of 22 baptisms have come through young adults and young marrieds. And so Gunnar put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ and had a friend, a co-worker named Gavin. Gavin was far from God, and he started to ask questions, and God was pursuing after his heart. And so Gavin came, and he put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ and was baptized. And Gavin's friend Hayden came just to watch Gavin get baptized and to celebrate in that moment. But God for a year and a half was working in Hayden's heart. And Hayden's watching online just like several people are watching and engaging online at this moment. But Hayden came to watch Gavin get baptized. But little did he know that he needed to take his next step in baptism. And because of him being here and because God working in his heart... Hayden, who for a year and a half has been following God, and God's led him to have a Bible study at his house where just about a month ago, four or five people put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ in this man's home. And Hayden and a couple of his friends got to get baptized in Lake Tyler a couple of weeks ago. Why do I share those stories? Because I think sometimes we can come into this room and we can miss and capture what God is doing around a home, around a facility, around a ministry, around this church. God is working. And it starts with a simple conversation. It starts with an invitation. And it starts with gathering around a table. And last week we kicked this series off and most of these conversations and stories that we're going to look at is through the gospel of Luke. You know, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the gospels. But Luke's gospel is a little different than the rest of them. Each gospel has different things that make them unique. 
Luke's gospel, it's funny because most of the conversations, interactions, encounters are around a meal or a home. And Robert Karras said this, Jesus is either at a meal, he's coming from a meal, or he's going to a meal. This is the uniqueness of the gospel of Luke that we see. And last week, we kicked this series off looking at Mary and Martha. One of my favorite stories, but so many times we're just busy that we can miss what matters most that's right in front of us. And that's being in the presence of God. Martha was so distracted by doing things for Jesus that she missed Jesus himself. And we're called to action as you come into this room, maybe far from God, maybe new to church, or maybe you find this place home every single week. We can so many times in our lives do things for God that we miss Jesus himself. And it was a call for all of us to not miss what matters most, those moments in the presence of Jesus. And today we're going to talk and navigate another story in Luke chapter 5. So I want to encourage you to get your Bibles out, you version on your phone or the giant TVs behind me. But Luke chapter 5 verse 27, it says this, after this, he went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. Now, some of you are, know uh, the name Levi by Matthew. Most people believe that it's in this encounter, in this story, that Jesus changes his name from Levi to Matthew. Because when Jesus, that's what Jesus does. When you put your faith and trust in him, when you follow him, the scripture tells us he gives us new passions, he gives us new hobbies, and some places in scripture says he gives you a new name. When he gives you a new name, that means your next is better than your now. And we see that with Levi and Matthew. But in the gospel of Luke, it says after this, what's after this? Well, Jesus is going town to town, place to place, home to home, feasting, uh, doing miracles. He just healed a man of leprosy, pretty big deal. And he also healed a paralyzed man. And he healed this paralyzed man because of three friends. Three friends knew that they, if they could get their friend to Jesus, that he could change not only his status as being paralyzed, but they could change his life. And because of the faith, Scripture says, because of the faith of the friends, this man was changed. And I think Jesus is about to expand on what he is talking about. There's a reason this passage of Scripture and the, the, the conversation, the feast with Levi happens after this healing of this paralyzed man. But we see that... Who you bring to the table and who you invite to your table, it says a lot about you. I remember growing up in uh, elementary school, even some in middle school before I played school sports, there was recess, amen, everybody needs to bring that back and work, and PE. Anybody remember this? And, and, and my go-tos were basketball and dodgeball. Like, I loved basketball and dodgeball. Uh, when I wasn't in timeout on the fence, you know what I'm saying? And so, uh, but how, how does that work? It always starts with everybody gets out there and you pick your squad, right? You pick the fastest, the strongest. Anybody picked last, be honest, right? <laughs> uh, you know, who you have on your team, it says a lot about where you're going and how you're going to win. And so, you know, I say those, those things and I bring back those memories even in my life because who you have on your team says a lot about you. But notice what Jesus, the first thing I want you to see in this text and the first thing I want you to write down is this. Jesus would choose someone of Levi's character. Jesus would choose someone of Levi's character character, a tax collector named Levi, Matthew. 
Now, most of you know, some of you don't know, nobody liked tax collectors, not even their own people. The Jews didn't like them. The Gentiles didn't like them. They were the outcast of society, tax collectors were, because of several reasons. One, that they robbed their own people from money. There, there was no set agenda when it comes to taxes. It wasn't 2.5%. It was I'm going to charge however I want to charge to put in my pocket, and you're going to like it or not. And so there are people that didn't like tax collectors because they stole from their own people. They stole from their friends. You know, the Gentiles didn't like them. The Jews didn't like them. They were the outcast of society, yet Jesus would choose a man by the name of Levi and his character to be on his team. This is unique because most of us, if we're picking a team, would choose the best, the most talented, the best communicators, the richest people. And Jesus would ask someone of this nature and background to follow him. Now, this phrase, follow him, was only used for rabbis to choose his disciples. So Jesus is calling his team. He's getting his squad to change the world. And he flips the script and chooses Levi, a tax collector. As we continue to read, it says this in verse 28, and leaving everything, he rose and followed him. And Levi made him a great feast in his house and there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at the table with them Levi immediately leaves to follow Jesus he leaves everything his career his possessions his wealth to follow after this man named Jesus Levi knew about Jesus it's it's not like they really knew each other. It's not like he had multiple dinners with Jesus that led him to this uh, following. He knew about Jesus. He knew the rumors, Jesus performing miracles, Jesus healing, his teachings. He knew that there was something different about this guy. He didn't know all the answers. He didn't have all the answers. But he knew that he was willing to go all in with this man named Jesus to risk it all. Because he saw in this man something different. And when you say yes and follow Jesus Christ, it's the greatest decision that you can ever make in your life. You don't have to have all the answers. You just got to know that that man, there's something different about Jesus and he can change everything about who you are. You're not tied down to your past. You're not a sinner anymore, but you're alive in Christ. And, and Levi saw something different in Christ. And he wanted to follow after him. Not only would Jesus call Levi someone of his character to follow him, but leads us to number two. Jesus would go and feast with him. Would go and feast with him. Would have dinner with him. Would go to his house. Now Levi wanted to make Jesus this big feast and meal for a couple reasons. Number one, I believe, to honor Jesus. Levi just followed Jesus, and Scripture says to, to give honor where honors do. And this was the greatest decision of Levi's life. There was something different about this man named Jesus. He was captured by Jesus, and he wanted to honor him. So he made him this big feast. And said, Jesus, thank you for, for pursuing me, for changing me. But also, I believe he wanted to publicly let people know that he was following after Jesus Christ. And so he invites his tax collector friends because he has no other friends because everybody dislikes this man. And so he brings his tax collector buddies over to publicly let them know where he stands. But also to pray, probably, 
that they would make the same decision. Because following Jesus isn't just enough. We're called to share and bring people to the feet of Jesus. And Levi, Matthew, would set the tone and an example of this, of not just eating and feasting with Jesus, but bringing his friends to Jesus. Imagine that dinner. A bunch of people far from God dining with Jesus. Probably looking at each other and saying, hey, bro, we can't cuss. Jesus is here. I've been to dinners before. and Families talk before I get there. Hey, preacher's coming. You can't cuss. Imagine, you know, they can't discuss what they drank or how they partied the night before. I mean, this is dinner with Jesus. So imagine the, the, the awkwardness on both sides of this dinner table, the conversations that are taking place. And at this moment, at the table, Jesus wants to remind us of this, that Jesus came to dine with sinners. Sinners, to invest and feast with the outcast. Not to join in on their sin or lifestyle, but he used this feast and meal to love on them, to build relationships with them, to teach and rebuke to a new way of life. In verse 30, and the Pharisees and their scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, why do you eat and drink with the tax collectors and sinners? Now, the Pharisees and scribes, they were supposed to be the religious people in this day. And they hated this. They grumbled. They complained. They gossiped. They protested. People don't do that now, right? They didn't unite the cause. They divided the cause. And the people that were supposed to be the ones closest to Jesus despised Jesus for what he was doing. Their view of purity was to stay away from sinners, was to separate from them. A couple of years ago, to quarantine from them. Like, do not be near them. I'm religious, you're not. Stay away. That was their view of purity, to be clean. The scribes and Pharisees criticized Jesus because they did not understand his message or his ministry. They didn't understand it. And I want you to really hear me on this. Whether you find yourself in this room a student or an adult, Jesus simply did not fit into their traditional religious life. Jesus didn't fit into their box and their view of God that they held. It's like what I say sometimes, this Plato Christianity, where we mold and shape Christ to what we want him to be. And if it doesn't meet our standards, our view, my theology, I get rid of it and I start over. And Jesus didn't fit into their way of life. He came and he did things differently. He changed stuff. I don't like change. Right? Can I just be honest with you for a second? I think more people like change than they think they do. They just like it on their standard. Not somebody else's. I like to get new clothes. I like to drive in that new car. I love that new iPhone that comes out every single year. I want Jesus to fit what I want him to be. And when he goes beyond that, it's hard for me. And Jesus came to change the way of life. He came to seek and save the lost. And it is unfortunate. Hear me. It is unfortunate. When people resist change and refuse to try to understand the new things that God is doing. This meal and feast 
was for the saved, but it was also for the people far from God. In verse 31, and Jesus answered them, who? The religious people. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those that are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus states the obvious here. Sick people don't need doctors. Well, sick people do need doctors, not the healthy ones. I don't randomly just go to a doctor. I don't, I don't like doctors. Anybody with me? I'm not just going to randomly show up to a doctor. I'm only going to go if I need a doctor. Jesus' mission was to invite the spiritually sick to repent and experience a restored relationship with God. He didn't come to just hang out with religious people. Hey, you want, you want to come over to dinner? Well, what's for tomorrow? And we'll just gather everybody around tomorrow and next week. He didn't come just to, to hang out with the Pharisees and scribes and the religious leaders of the day. He came to seek the lost. The people far from God. Another parallel story we see in the Gospel of Luke is that Jesus would leave the 99 for the one. This makes no sense in our minds. But here's the thing. The 99 were healthy. They were doing what they were supposed to be doing. They were safe. It was the one that was gone. It was the one that was in need help. It was the one that needed to be pursued. And Jesus says, I'm going to leave you and I'm going to go after you. That's the love of God that we just sang about. That the love of God that would pursue you in your weakest moments, in your sin, in your mess, would allow you to dine and sit at the table with Jesus. That's the love of God. And that Jesus would say and share with us in this moment that this table, this building, this facility is for both. This story and meal show us an important part of living for Jesus, and that's this. You cannot live your life before and still follow Jesus. Levi was aiming and heading into one direction. He was a sinner not looking for Jesus. And Jesus pursued after him, called him by name, and said, follow me. Jesus found him. Levi left his old life and completely turned and aimed his focus on Jesus. He left everything, his possessions, his work, his money, even to a point that he provided a meal, a feast for Jesus, but also to let his friends know where he stands publicly. That's why the greatest need in your life and next step in your life after you follow Jesus Christ is to get baptized. Publicly letting people know that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ. It's not on a need to know basis. It's not like, oh man, I hope they don't know who I voted for. But your life and your light should radiate in such a way that when they see you, they know that you're a follower of Christ. And Levi, at this moment, said, I'm following after him. I'm going all in, and I'm going to let people know. I'm going to publicly let people know with this meal. But this story and meal also shows us this. Everyone has a seat at the table of Jesus. Everyone. The deacon, life group leader, sitting right next to the attic that wants to follow Christ. You know the sad thing about our culture today? That there's a lot of people and there's a lot of churches that think church is all about them. It's a place where religious people gather to pray, to worship, to hear a message, to feel good about themselves, and to come back next week. Church is for religious people. It is great to gather 
and to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ and to pray with one another and to have uniqueness and unite in a cause. But it's also a place where people far from God can come into this place. They can feel welcomed, they can feel belonged, and they can see the good news of Jesus Christ, this gospel. It is for you, but it's not about you. It's not about you. And the uniqueness of this table, this feast, is a parallel, what I believe, is what Jesus is calling us to do. We come to this table very different. Theology, political views, family background, They don't look like me, they don't think like me, they don't act like me. We bring so much differences to the table. But the one thing that we have in common that we unite on is to be in the presence of Jesus Christ and to allow him to mold us and shape us to be more like his son, Jesus. Because here's the thing. It's at the table where life change happens. You know, we have a, 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 this mindset in our culture, and I did for several years, that we have got to be good enough to feast with Jesus. I've got to wait till I stop doing that. I've got to wait till I'm older. I've got to wait till I'm more mature. I've got to wait till I grow a little bit more. And we bought into this culture lie that you've got to have everything figured out before being in the presence of Jesus Christ. And Jesus says, that's not the case. If it is the case, then you're never going to feast with Jesus Christ because there's always going to be something in your life, situation or circumstance that blocks you from sitting at the table with Jesus. But it's at this table where he wants to change your life. It's at this table that you grow. It's at the feet and the presence of Jesus Christ where you unite. And more than anything, I've said this before, we've had several people say it before, several pastors and churches, but when we live in a divided nation, We need a united church, a body of people. And that happens when you bring your differences and who you are to the table of Jesus and you sit in the presence of who he is. Because he will change everything about you. You can't live a life the same and follow Jesus. So you might be there this morning. You might be sitting in your chair and you say, man, David, how do I know that I'm a, I'm a follower of Christ? How do I know that I have a relationship with Jesus? Well, tell me about your life. Is there anything different? Well, I've said a prayer before. Fantastic. What's been different about you after that prayer? Because otherwise it's just praying empty prayers. Now, you're not perfect. You're not going to be perfect. You're always going to struggle. I'm not perfect. But my life is radically different from that moment that I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. How are you different? And for some of you today, maybe for the first time, you need to have an honest assessment in your heart and in your mind if you put your faith and trust in Him. And maybe for you, for the very first time, this morning is that day. Today is your Sunday. Just like Gavin, just like Gunner, just like Hayden, just like so many people have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ this year. Today is your day where you can say, I need Jesus Christ to change me. And for some of you, if I'm just honest, we forgot that Jesus came to seek and save the lost. And he wants us to partner with him in the greatest rescue mission of all time.
do people know that you're a believer? Have you publicly let people know that you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? What you stand for? And are you bringing people far from God to the table of Jesus Christ? I'm going to ask all of us to bow our heads and close our eyes this morning. Maybe you're here this morning, maybe for the first time, or maybe God is speaking into your heart and into your mind in such a way that you just, you hear Him and you feel Him this morning. And there's never been a time that you've surrendered to Jesus Christ. Jesus in heaven is not the default answer in life. Hell is. And your sin and your life was heading there until Jesus pursued and came and lived a life that you couldn't live and to die on a cross that was meant for you. And Jesus wants to radically change your life today. And maybe you come in this room and you've never made that decision. You've never had that moment putting your faith and trust in Jesus. Today is your Sunday. And God, I pray that you would speak into the hearts and minds of people all across this room.